Hello friends, I am Dr. Santosh Abraham and this is the first lecture on adrenals. So I will go with the physiology and the investigations uh, needed for adrenals and later on I will come to uh, hyperaldosteronism. And the next lecture I will co cover the remaining topics. So the normal adrenal, the normal adrenal weighs 4 to 5 grams uh, and the cortex is the main component of the adrenal, it's almost around 90%. The arterial supply is from the renal arteries, iota, inferior phrenic artery and the venous drainage, uh, to the right it drains to inferior vena cava and to the left it drains to the left renal vein. So this is the... Uh, diagram showing the arterial supply and the adrenal glands in general. So here you can see the right adrenal uh, is supplied by the adrenal artery, right adrenal artery and it is draining to the right adrenal vein. Uh, which drains to the inferior vena cava. So the left adrenal gland is supplied by the left adrenal artery and then it drains, it, it drains into the left adrenal vein which in turn drains into the left renal vein. So uh, on histology you could see three zones uh, in the cortex that is the glomerulosa which secretes aldosterone, the fasciculata which secretes cortisol and androgens and the uh, reticularis. Uh, the fasciculata and the reticularis combinedly secrete the cortisol and an androgens. and the medulla which secretes the epinephrine and norepinephrine. So the fasciculata preferably secretes, you know, in, uh, mainly secretes cortisol and uh, the reticularis predominantly secretes androgens. So this is basically the pathway which you all know and the end products which you all know. So I'm not going to go into much details here. So the glucocorticoids, approximately 10 to 20 milligram of cortisol is secreted from the sonar fasciculata. Androgens mainly from the sonar reticularis and both of these, the reticularis and the fasciculata are regulated by the ACTH. The mineral corticoids uh, are mainly aldosterone. It is uh, 100 to 150 microgram per day secreted by sauna glomerulosa and it is under the RAS pathway, the renin angiotensin aldosterone pathway. So, and as you know, you can see the renin angiotensin aldosterone pathway. So angiotensinogen is produced in the liver, it is converted to angiotensin 1 by renin which is secreted from the jextra glomerular apparatus and angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2 by the ACE which is secreted by the pulmonary and renal endothelium and angiotensin 2 increases sympathetic activity, it causes tubular reabsorption of sodium and chloride and uh, also potassium excretion. It causes, it stimulates the release of aldosterone from the adrenals and also it causes arterial vasoconstriction and the pituitary it could also even really uh, release the ADH.
So when the circulating blood volume increases, the renal perfusion pressure increases. So it activates the dextroglomerular cells. Also increase catecholamines and uh, hypokalemia could also activate the JG cells whereas hyperkalemia and uh, increased uh, tubular sodium will uh, inhibit the JG cells. So when the JG cells are uh, you know, stimulated by decreased renal perfusion pressure, increased catecholamines and decreased potassium it simulates the release of uh, renin and renin converts angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1 which is converted to angiotensin 2 and 2 causes the angiotensin 2 causes the aldosterone release which causes increased renal retention and other stimuli for increasing aldosterone releases ACTH so increase uh, potassium and increase potassium excretion so uh, as well as uh, decrease potassium dopamine etc will inhibit the release of aldosterone and via uh, re retaining renal sodium it will maintain the circulating blood volume or it will try to re retain water and restore the circulating blood volume So androgens are produced both from the reticulata as well as fasciata. So in the form of DHE and androstenedione, uh, they are under, un, under the control of ACTH. So urinary steroids are useful in mental corticoid hypertension, PCOS, CAH, Cushing's and androgen resistance. Imaging. So in imaging the adrenal, CT is the most widely used modality. So it detects masses more than 5 mm in diameter. So it could differentiate between benign tumors and with high fat content like adenoma, myelolipoma uh, as shown by pre-contrast tumor density of less than 10 Hound-Field units. MRI can also detect adrenal masses fi uh, between 5 and 10 millimeters and in some circumstances it could provide some additional information. So it determines, it is, uh, it detects uh, by d uh, by determining the signal loss in opposed phase T2 weighted sequences. Rapid signal loss shows that the tumor is benign while the, if there is a lack of uh, signal loss or a delay in signal loss which could show malignant tumors and also FEO. Ultrasound uh, normally does not show normal adrenals and it detects masses when the diameter is more than 20 millimeter. So the CT is the most widely used modality. It could differentiate between adrenal tumors and um, with high fat content. So uh, it is indicated by a in, uh, Hounds field unit of 10. So this is where this is the picture of a CT scan, abdominal CT scan, where you can see the normal adrenal here and an ad adrenal adenoma here. What about radionucleotide imaging? I-123 MIBG. So it is concentrated in the pheochromocytomas, paragangliomas, carcinoid tumors, neuroblastomas. So it's used diagnostically. Another I-131 MIBG scan can be used therapeutically. And 123 iodometamidate is a non-inhibitor of 11-beta-hydroxylase or CYP11B1. So CYP11B1 is specifically expressed in the adrenal gland. So iodometamidate spec can identify adrenocortical tissue. So PET can be useful in locating tumors and METs. So uh, for example 7 uh, uh, for example, 11 C metahydroxyephedrine combined with the CT PET uh, could detect pheochromocytomas.
and PET could also find out occult neuroendocrine tumors. Especially 11C metamidate PET uh, CT uh, recently has been shown to help in lateralizing aldosterone producing adrenal masses. So adrenal vein sampling, so this is basically used to lateralize the tumor. So it's indicated in bilateral adrenal changes, in patients with bilateral adrenal changes, and also in aged patients above 50, where uh, primary aldosteronism is seen, is detected, and they have an apparent solitary adenoma on scanning. So basically the incidence of adrenal nodules rises with age, and adrenal sam vein sampling AVS should be undertaken only in patients where surgery is considered and surgery is feasible. It may not be necessary if there is a unilateral adrenal mass plus a potassium 3.51 presentation as this is suggestive of an adenoma. So it's mainly for bilateral adrenal changes and patients above 50 with primary aldosteronism who have an apparent solitary adenoma. It should be undertaken in patients who has any uh, who has got plans for surgery. So this is how the venous sampling is done. You can see the catheters going into the uh, resp respective vessels in the adrenals. So AVS allows a gradient of aldosterone detection between two sites. So this is the gold standard for differentiation between unilateral and bilateral aldosterone production. So cannulating the right adrenal vein is technically difficult because it drains directly to the inferior vena cava. Cortisol measurements are also taken to confirm successful positioning within the adrenal veins and it should be more than three times than the peripheral samples. That is the central to peripheral ratio should be more than three. So uh, the basically the concentration of cortisol in adrenal vein will be more than three times than that of a peripheral vein like an uh, inferior vena cava. So this should be carried out in specialist centers only. Experienced centers could achieve a success rate of 70%. So this gradient actually helps us to differentiate between unilateral and bilateral aldosterone production. Right adrenal vein is technically difficult to cannulate and cortisol measurements are simultaneously taken uh, to ensure that the catheter is successfully positioned and there should be uh, a central to peripheral ratio greater than 3 and it should be carried out in specialized centers. So this is how uh, the results for AVS are, inter uh, are interpreted. So there are two indexes, indices actually, selectivity index, so which shows the adrenal vein to peripheral vein cortisol ratio. So it indicates successful catheterization of the adrenal vein uh, if the selectivity ratio is more than three it indicates that the adrenal vein is successfully catheterized. And the other one is the lateralization index so the epsilateral addressin uh, and aldosterone cortical co cortisol ratio uh, is divided by the contralateral aldosterone cortisol ratio. So a lateral in, in lateralization index of more than four denotes unilateral aldosterone producing adenoma, and Li less than two denotes idiopathic hyperaldosteronism, and two to four is in borderline. So the Bain index selectivity index more than three indicates successful catheterization and lateralization index more than four it, it denotes unilateral APA or uh, unilateral aldosterone, aldosterone producing adenoma. So the most po popular technique uh, to confirm the success of selective AVS uh, is the calculation of the ratio of concentrations of cortisol from adrenal vein and infraadrenal IVC or a peripheral vein defines as the selectivity index which I've already spoken to you before. 
So cortisol is exclusively secreted from the adrenal cortex and it is not generally or produced in the adenoma producing aldosterone. So the concentration gradient between the adrenal vein and the IVC or a peripheral vein indicates that the placement of the catheter step is in the adrenal vein. And it's uh, easily assayable and uh, and it's it's the most widely used hormone uh, and it's it's produced at a high rate so cortisol is mainly used but now they're also trying to experiment with epinephrine metanephrine and chromogranin A so the calculation of the ratio of the con uh, cons cortisol concentrations from adrenal and infra adrenal veins IVC or peripheral vein constitutes the selectivity index. This is based on the assumption that cortisol is exclusively selected from, select, secreted from the adrenal cortex. And when there is a concentration gra gradient found, it indicates that the catheter tip is in the adrenal vein. So let's uh, find, so let's see the uh, AVS results for one of the patients. You can see here the right adrenal vein, the aldosterone concentration is 17,300 and the cortisol is 1,210. And the left adrenal vein, the aldosterone is 952 and the cortisol is 419. So in, 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 in the respectively the peripheral veins, Uh, it, it shows uh, it shows f uh, 48 aldosterone in the inferior vena cava and cortisol is 19 so definitely the aldosterone to cort cortisol ratio is 14.3 and the left adrenal veins uh, the left adrenal is uh, 2.3 and the inferior vena cava it's 2.5 so it's more or less the same here but you can see that when you divide the right adrenal vein to the left adrenal vein the aldosterone ratio becomes 6.2 so the, which, which means that there is the there is a tumor which produces aldosterone in the right side So the cortisol concentrations from the adrenal veins and the inferior vena cava are used to confirm the successful catheterization. So adrenal vein cortisol to inferior vein vena cava cortisol ratio is typically more than 10 is to 1. So as you can see the adrenal vein to the inferior vena cava and the adrenal vein and the, uh, from the left to the inferior vena cava, it's anyway it's more than 10. Uh, in the first case, it is approximately 60, and the second case, it is approximately uh, it's approximately 8. So, uh, in, and div in dividing the plasma aldosterone concentrations of the right and left adrenal veins by the respective cortisol concentration, it, this corrects for the dilutional effect of blood from the inferior phrenic vein flowing to the left adrenal vein. So, hence they are called the cortisol corrected aldosterone ratios. The lateralization ratio in this patient is 6.2 to 1 and the, it's, it's consistent with the right adrenal APA. So mineral corticoid as excess. There are two forms: primary hyperaldosteronism and secondary hyperaldosteronism. So primary hyperaldosteronism is characterized by increased aldosterone 
hypersecretion and it is autonomous and it shows suppressed renin le levels but secondary hyperaldosteronism occurs when aldosterone is uh, produced more due to elevated uh, renin level so in primary uh, and secondary both aldosterone is high but uh, renin is low in the primary and renin is high in the secondary so what will be the causes for primary and secondary so here are the causes for primary and secondary in primary hyperaldosterone it's corn syndrome the causes are corn syndrome bilateral adrenal hyperplasia which is the most common it's almost around 60 percent whereas corn is only 35 percent and very rarely leukocorticoid remediable aldosteronism constituting less than one person and very rarely an aldosterone producing carcinoma secondary hyperaldosteronism can be found in renal artery stenosis renal hyperperfusion uh, cirrhosis ccf nephrotic syndrome where there is hyperperfusion of the kidneys and also in a renin secreting tumor which is very very rare so basically when you have low blood volume to the kidneys you have this hyperaldosteronism secondary secondary hyperaldosteronism so here all the renin will be high in all these cases but here the adrenals produce aldosterone independently of the renin so the renin is suppressed that is in corn syndrome in adrenal hyperplasia and in GRA and in the carcinoma and other mineral corticoid excess syndromes like apparent mineral corticoid excess liquorice ingestion which inhibits 11 beta HSD2 deoxycorticosterone and corticosterone excesses ectopic ACTH secretion congenital adrenal hyperplasia and exogenous mineral corticoids also in three other syndromes called Bartos, Kittelman and Lindens, you have pseudo aldosteronism so let's uh, discuss about the mineral corticoid excess syndrome so apparent mineral corticoid excess so uh, it, it is due to 11 beta HSD2 deficiency it's an inactivating mutation so there is failure to thrive, polydipsia, hypertension or mild deforms in type 2 that there will be partial uh, activity of the 11 beta HSD2 so the investigation is uri tetrahydrocortisone to tetrahydrocortisone ratio that will be increased and management is, is by giving dexamethasone in liquorice it also inhibits the 11 beta HSD2 so there will be a history of sweets cough syrup or herbals so investigation uh, as per the clinical scenario and uh, management is by all stopping liquorice so then you have the congenital adrenal hyperplasia two forms 17 alpha hydroxylase and 11 beta hydroxylase so in the 17 alpha hydroxylase 79 alpha hydroxylase deficient so there is delayed puberty and the deoxycortical cortisone increases in this case and the treatment is steroids whereas in the 11 beta hydroxylase there could be ambiguous genitalia and vir vir virilization TFC cortisone here increases and the treatment is against steroids in Cushing's disease uh, it is due to the mineral uh, mineral corticoid activity of cortisol so the treatment is surgical and uh, investigations are over diet dexamethasone suppression test and urine free cortisol and salivary cortisols so uh, primary hyperhaldosteronism uh, it constitutes uh, hypertension in 10% of the hypertensive patients of all the hypertensive patients so it is the most common form of secondary hypertension and most common cause is bilateral adrenal hyperplasia around 60 percent so it's the most common form of secondary hypertension so uh, when you think about this primary hypertension primary uh, hyperaldosteronism I told you there are four conditions before aldosteronoma, cons, bilateral adrenal hyperplasia, carcinoma and GRA so I told you about the frequency also the relative frequency is shown here and age of presentation is uh, in third to seventh sixth decade 
and fifth to seventh again carcinoma. I mean, it's very rare in the young, but GRA presence in the childhood. And uh, pathology, it's a benign adenoma in Crohn's syndrome, and there is high cholesterol. But in IHA, or bilateral adrenal hyperplasia, there is, there is macronodular or micronodular hyperplasia. Carcinoma, definitely the tumor is more than five, and it could also produce other hormones, and there could be evidence of invasion too. GRA, the cause is due to chimeric crime, crossover between CYP11B1 and CYP11B2. So it results in a gene which uh, becomes uh, so, uh, uh, which uh, which results in the formation of a ACTH responsive aldosterone synthase. So, this chimeric gene will code for a ACTH responsive aldosterone synthase. So, that's why it can be suppressed by glucocorticoids since the ACTH can be suppressed by administering the glucocorticoids. So, let's come to Korn syndrome. So, it's aldosterone producing adenoma but there are very high levels of aldosterone synthase. So uh, inactivating mutations in potassium channel KCJN5 in, is uh, in 40 percent of the cases is found to be a cause now. So KCJN5 inactivating mutations. It's a rarely it's a part of the MAN1 syndrome. So bilateral adrenal hyperplasia, it's the most common form of primary hyperaldosteronism. It's commonly bilateral. It's associated with micronodular or macronodular hyperplasia. And the aldosterone uh, secretion is very sensitive to circulating angiotensin II. Korn syndrome. Sorry. So JRA, it's autosomal dominant. As I noted, as I've told you, it's a uh, cause due to chim chimeric gene 8q22. So it leads to the expression of aldosterone synthase in fasciculate as well as glomerular glomerulosa. So that's why this the aldose secretion comes under the control of ACTH. There is early hypertension and family history. And hybrid steroids, 18 hydroxycortisone and 18 oxocortisol are formed here. And in carcinoma, it's rare. And there is also other corticosteroids uh, secreted, like cortisol, androgen, estrogens. Uh, hypokalemia could be very, very profound, and aldosterone levels could be very high. So, if there is an aldosterone excess in a tumor larger than 2.5 centimeter, it could be a carcinoma. So, it, it has to be treated as suspicious. So what are the indications for investigating for a, a secondary cause of hypertension thought to be due to hyper, primary hyperaldosteronism? So people who are resistant to conventional antihypertensives, that is not controlled on more than on three agents. And there is hypokalemia, irrespective of thiazides, potassium less than 0.37. But you have to think that, uh, we have to know that low potassium is present only in 40 percent so hypokalemia is not diagnostic of um, aldosterone primary hyperaldosteronism and also hi young hypertensives before the age of 40 and who have an incident loma so these are the indications for uh, for investigating primary hyperaldosteronism that is in people who are hypertensive and resistant to con conventional hypertensives, more than three agents, or hypokalemia, potassium less than 3.7, and young age, less than 40, and who have an incident loma. So before investigating, give oral supplements of potassium to control hypokalemia. So you should ensure that the patient has a normal kal kalemic blood picture Try to stop. No, you don't need to stop all the antihypertensive medications for the first screening. And the only medication uh, that must be stopped is the MR antagonist. Uh, 
mainly the spinal electron and epineuron and well there is a controversy whether it should be stopped four weeks prior to diagnostic tests test or six weeks anyway according to the OHCE uh, the Oxford Handbook of Clinical Endocrinology it's four weeks so uh, since you are uh, the patient is taking the antihypertensives the test should uh, results should be interpreted in the light of that so beta blockers could cause false positives whereas the ACE and the AR2Bs could cause false negatives and also borderline cases if you want to perform the, uh, the test without any drugs then you can use uh, doxorosin or calcium endocrinus that um, because they don't influence this test this test and false negatives are also found in patients with chronic renal failure because of upregulated up plasma renin so these are the drugs uh, which has an effect on the ARRI beta blockers so they cause a false positive whereas the AC inhibitors and AR2 inhibitors they cause false negatives calcium antagonists alpha mammon blockers have no effect on these so they are particular uh, they are found to be safe and even the diuretics so in if in doubt don't start the beta blockers and don't start the uh, spinulolactone or epinolone and try to avoid the AC inhibitors and the AR2Bs but you could start with the alpha blockers and the calcium antagonists and the, even the diuretics so this is uh, basically uh, what the endocrine society is uh, recommending before you proceed with uh, investigations in primary hyperallosteronism so attempt to correct the hypokalemia so uh, avoid fist clenching and wait at least five seconds after the tunica release in in collecting the pot potassium and it should be collected slowly and ensure that the separation of plasma from cells within 30 minutes of collection and the patient should have a liberalized sodium intake so withdraw agents that may affect the ARR prior to four weeks spironolactone, epilrenone, amyloride, triamterone etc also licorice, potassium wasting diuretics etc if the results are not diagnostic and if the hypertension can be controlled by non-interfering medications you can withdraw other medications to a repeat ARR so at least two weeks before you could stop the beta adrenergic blockers uh, drugs like clonidine, alpha and NSAIDs, the ACEs, the AR2Bs, renin inhibitors and uh, the dihydropyridine calcium channel antagonist as well if you need to uh, maintain the hypertension under control you could use ferapamil slow release hydro hydrolysine prasosine doxorosine etc also estrogen containing medications could lower the drug response curve and cause false positive arr So it could uh, when the dose response curve is measured actually so caution should be also taken when they are on the oral contraceptives and the hormone replacement therapies so condition for the blood collection the patient has to be relaxed has to be sitting standing or walking for at least two hours and seated for five to fifteen minutes so after the patient has been sitting standing or walking he should be uh, uh, doing that activity I mean the normal activity for at least two hours and seated for five to fifteen minutes before taking the blood so slowly take the blood avoiding hemolysis maintain sample at room temperature so in older patients patients above 65 the renin can be lowered more than aldosterone so it could raise to uh, lead to raised ARR Premenstruating or ovulating females have higher ARRs, so it could 
cause false positives. And time of the day, recent diet, posture, length of the time, medications, method of blood collection, level of potassium, level of creatinine. I mean, if the renal failure can also lead to false positive errors. So these are all factors need to be taken into account. So medications uh, which don't affect uh, or which have minimal effects on the blood pressure in in the primary hyperaldosteronism are shown as before, uh, as, as shown in this table, mainly the prasocin, doxocin, terasocin, and verapamil and hydrolysin. So the doses are shown as below. So alpha adrenergic blockers are very important and they are very helpful when you want to definitely confirm uh, ARR uh, primary hyper uh, when you want to definitely screen by ARR so once you have the ARR uh, the aldosterone drain ratio uh, done which is suggestive of primary hyper then you need to confirm the diagnosis so it's uh, you have to prove that the aldosterone is suppressed when you do uh, a sodium or volume loading to the patient. So when you give more sodium or more volume, uh, when the when you make when you increase the intravascular volume, the aldosterone should be suppressed. So uh, in normal patients, so you know this failure to suppress the aldosterone when you give more sodium or when you increase the intravascular uh, volume will show that will confirm the diagnosis so you know you have all these cumbersome tests the details I'll tell you but which you don't need to know for the exam uh, but the confirmatory tests are basically by saline infusion of fluidrocortisone suppression test or a dietary loading of sodium test dietary loading sodium test or a captopril suppression test the captopril suppression test is not uh, widely used because it's not very reliable so coming to the sit or the saline infusion test. So two normal, two liter normal saline is given on four hours. Adlosterone is measured at zero, two, three, and four hours. Four, four hours. So if the aldosterone is not falling below, So if the aldosterone is uh, failing to, uh, it it's fails in 80 to 90 percent of uh, primary aldosteronism. So it is used when uh, uh, it, it should be used in caution if the patient is having fluid overload or evidence of heart failure. So in this test, the patient stays recommend for at least one hour, and during the IV infusion. So it's given over four hours, starting at in the morning and renin aldosterone cortisol and potassium are checked zero and fourth hour fourth hours with bp and hr monitored there's a modified approach f uh, in which the patient sits for 30 minutes during the infusion and yeah, it is more sensitive so if the aldosterone levels are less than 140 picomol per liter or less than 5 nanogram per deciliter primary aldosteronism is unlikely but if the levels are more than 10 nanogram per deciliter very probable that there is uh, primary aldosteronism especially it's like 280 to three, uh, 300 nanomoles per liter between 5 and 10 are indeterminate so for the sit seated sit the aldosterone of more than 6 confirms PA And uh, it should not be do done in patients with severe uncontrolled hypertension, renal insufficiency, cardiac arrhythmias, or severe hypokalemia. The next test is the dietary sodium test. 
loading test. So, uh, patient is ensured. Pa uh, you ensure that the patient takes a diet with a high sodium content. So, the aim is to raise the sodium intake to 200 millimoles per lit per day for three days. So, you can even give supplemental sodium chloride tablets. Pa potassium should be maintained in the normal levels. So, that is failure to suppress aldosteronism in primary aldosteronism. But it's difficult to execute, has limited diagnostic value, where people take a high sodium. So uh, basically, it uh, you give sodium uh, uh, for high sodium for three three days. They also receive slow release potassium chloride supplementation to maintain plasma potassium in the normal range. So urinary aldosteronism aldosterone is measured in the 24-hour unit collection from the morning day third to the day fourth of, uh, in the morning. So if urinary aldosterone is, is less than 10 microgram in the absence of renal disease uh, it is unlikely so that means that it is suppressed in the presence of the salt if uh, there is elevated urinary aldosterone aldosterone excretion then it makes PA very likely so it should not be performed in patients with severe uncontrolled hypertension renal insufficiency cardiac arrhythmia or severe hypokalemia so 24-hour urine collection also may be inconvenient. So there are also lab, so some lab-specific poor performance issues for this test, but it has been obviated by the HPLC tandem mass spectrometry now. I mean, that has made the test more reliable now. How about the FST? So you give 100 micrograms of fludrocortisone six hourly for four days. So that will be 24 doses. And you measure the plasma aldosterone basally and on the last day. So if it is, if it uh, fails to get suppressed, it is primary hyperaldosterone. So it's difficult to execute hyperkalemic and hypertensive patients. So it's 100 micrograms, six hourly for four days, two ma plasma aldosterone measurements, and failure to suppress it indicates primary hyperaldosterone. Mm, also, you give the slow release KCL supplements with that and slow release NACL supplements. So, if uh, and on the day for the plasma aldosterone and the PRA are measured with the patient the seated posture and make sure that you have a cortisol measurement also for the patient. So upright plasma aldosterone more than 6 nanogram per deciliter on the fourth day confirms PA provided PRA is less than 1 nanogram per ml power and plasma cortisol is lower than the value obtained at 7 a.m. This is to ex exclude a confounding ACTH, so ACTH effect. So plasma aldosterone should be more than 6 nanogram per deciliter and it confirms PA on day four. So FST is considered to be very sensitive, it's less intrusive and potentially confounding effects of potassium are controlled and ACTH through cortisol is also monitored and detected so that's the advantage and it's also considered to be safe. So sensitive, less intrusive, confounding effects removed, ACTH are mo is monitored and it is safe and compared with others. Captopril suppression test which is used very less so they receive 25 to 50 milligram of captopril after sitting or standing for at least one hour but it could be quickly done so it's that's uh, another importance of this test. So blood samples are drawn for measurement of plasma renin activity, aldosterone and cortisol at time zero and also at one or two hours after the challenge and this patient should remain seated during this period. So it's normally suppressed by uh, captopril in normal patients. In PA it is elevated and PRA remains suppressed. But the problem with this test is that there are reports of substantial number of false negative or equivocal results with this.
and also in IA8 sometimes there is a decrease of some decrease of aldosterone levels uh, than the APA is noted. So localization of primary hyperaldosterone is mainly with CT and AVS. AVS I have discussed before. CT in bilateral adrenal hyperplasia, it, uh, the, both the glands appear enlarged or could be normal. There could be macronodular hyperplasia uh, with a lots of nodules. A mass more than 4 cm is suspicious of carcinoma and it is unusual in Kohn syndrome. So if it is more than 4 cm, it is, could be a cancer and it is very less uh, suggestive of Kohn syndrome. But in, even in essential hypertension, nodules are described surprisingly. So by merely seeing the nodules and hypertension without any other evidence, you cannot tell that the patient is having uh, secondary hypertension due to primary hyperaldosteronism. So the treatment uh, for aldosterone secreting adenomas is basically by laparoscopic adrenalectomy. But in idiopathic hyperaldosteronism, uh, it is not needed because uh, the surgery does not cure the hypertension. So before the surgery, you give pre-surgical spironolactone to correct potassium. And also uh, pre-operatively, you tr uh, the look the BP with spironolactone. So if the BP control is good, you know, the response to surgery after the, uh, uh, you know, after the, the tumor is removed will also be better after the surgery. So hypertension, in about 70% of the cases, hypertension is cured. So if the hypertension passes, you need medical treatment. So 50% become normotensive in one month and 70% in one year. Whereas in adrenal carcinoma, you don't go for the lap surgery, you go for the open surgery and post-operatively you have to treat with mitotain which is an adrenalytic. So post-open surgery with mitotain and the prognosis is very poor. Medical management, so if it is not, the patient is not a surgical candidate such as patients with bilateral disease or with a solitary adrenal adenoma who cannot be cured by surgery or who don't want a surgery or who are unfit, you can use spironolactone with uh, other AC inhibitors and epilenone. So epilenone has got less anti, uh, so it is without anti-androgen effects and it's got greater selectivity when compared with spironolactone. And amyloride and triamprin can be also used. In GRA, the treatment is with low dose dexamethasone, 0.25 to 0.5 milligram at night. Thank you.